I get it. You're stressed. That's why you clicked on this. And Alex and I, in today's episode, are here to dive into some very actionable things and solutions to your stress so that you can manage your stress and just live a better life altogether. Thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure you share this with a friend and subscribe, and we'll catch you on the inside. We often say that Alex is the king of manifestation. Wow. He says that he has manifested Miguel working here. Here we are over a year later, which is very exciting. Uh, what other things have you, have you manifested recently? This past week, I had a question on my question box on Instagram that asked what our plans were for this week past weekend. And we had actually zero until I made that post. And so I had said that we were going, we being you, your sister, Sam and myself going to a Clippers game, which is the AAA baseball team here in town. Uh, I said, we we're going to go to one of those games. And sure enough, you guys showed up and uh, we, I manifested us going mm -hmm. to that baseball game. We, we made it happen. Uh, and I'm actually wearing my Clippers gear right now. I'm the world's biggest Clippers fan. I actually, not that I've been a fan my whole life, but I've definitely gone to games since I was a little kid. And it's fun just going to the park, going to when they have like the puppy palooza or bark at the park. Uh, and I'm glad that you got to see it. It's a little bit nicer than a few of the other AAA teams we've been to with their stadiums. So it'll be a fun thing to do this spring and summer. Yeah. And I will say that with your shopping and going to the pro shop, uh, I don't know if anyone listening will, will relate to this, that Sue has to touch every single article of clothing, touch every single bit of it, make God sure she makes her right. entire round through the entire shop and will get to the very end and be like, I don't think I'm going to get anything. And I am always flabbergasted that we just spent 20 to 30 minutes talking about how great all these things are. Oh, this is cute. Oh, this would look so good on you. Oh, I like this. And then we get to the end and there's nothing in her hand. And then I'm like, okay, we just, even just for our time, I would like for you to buy something at this point so that we just don't walk away with the thought process of, well, we looked at everything, but didn't actually walk away with anything. But sometimes first you need to simmer on your idea. You don't always need to purchase something the first time you realize you like it. And the shopping experience in and of itself is fun to be able to look around. And how am I supposed to decide on what to buy if I haven't looked at everything? Because I could be making the wrong decision and spending my money wrong. And so I did go around and there were a lot of cute things that I kind of have bookmarked in my head for next time we go if I want it and if I feel the pull to it. But I went around, I did touch a lot of things because I'm big on texture. I got to make sure that it's comfortable because I saw a shirt that I like to start off, touched it too thin for me. I knew I wasn't going to like it. So went around the whole store. The second I saw this sweatshirt, I said, done deal. I'm getting that. So I feel good about it. Your shopping practices stress me out. Well, And with today's episode, this is so fitting because <laughs> this is going to teach me ways to better manage my stress as a whole. So when somebody asks you how you're doing, how often do you either hear the response or you say, like, I'm doing good. I'm just stressed. So I try not to answer this way because I think that it is a burden that probably the person who's asking is not really seeking to hear about because oftentimes when you answer in that way, it's something that it's not really progressing towards a better situation. You're just kind of dumping that emotion on the other person. So in recent time, years, I suppose, I haven't done a whole lot of that, but in prior to that, quite a bit. Yeah, I remember that that used to be kind of my default answer to just say, oh, I'm doing good, just stressed. And I found that I was having a lot more perceived stress than actual stress in my life. And there's going to be a few different aspects of stress. There's going to be acute and chronic, and then there's going to be perceived and actual. And then there's going to be the stress that you perpetuate consistently because of the circumstance that you've put yourself in. And being able to 
take those into account allows you to also sort through what stress is to you instead of just clumping it all together and saying, I'm stressed. Because I find when even clients say that of, oh, I'm just stressed, I'll ask them straight next question, what are you stressed about? And they have to give me a specific response. They just can't say, oh, well, you know, like work is stressful. And I'm like, all right, what about work is stressful? Because we need to be able to get to the bottom or the root of what the stress is or learn how to identify stress so that you can manage it. And this podcast isn't about getting rid of all stress. I actually don't want to get rid of all stress. And a small amount of stress is really beneficial. And especially, with this being a health and fitness podcast. If you're looking for your fitness goals, you need to put your body under stress in order for it to change within the training stimulus that you're under as well. But knowing that, it's helpful to understand that that's going to play a role within your overall stress levels of how much volume of stress is going into your day. Do you want to define those different components of stress for everyone as kind of a starting point so we all are listening from the same understanding? Sure. Acute stress is going to be stress from a specific event or a situation. So this could be something like a close deadline or an argument that you had or being in a traffic accident. Whereas chronic stress is going to be repeated exposure to long-term stressors. Like if you're in a really bad relationship or you have a toxic environment that you're a part of or a work environment, uh, you're in a high crime area, or if you have chronically bad sleep, that's going to put you in a place where you have chronic stress because you're not getting that sleep. And within acute stress, these can be things that, again, are uh, dealt with and addressed and you can move on from in a few days, whereas that chronic stress, it can be a lot more complicated depending on how chronic that stress has been. And it can require you to have to have outside help or counseling because within stress and not just saying only chronic stress, but stress can exacerbate or cause mental health issues. And so if you're in a place where your stress is unmanaged or unmitigated, then that can put you in the also in the place where your mental health isn't in a good spot at all. Now, if we're looking at the difference between having perceived stress versus actual stress, this is really going to come down to you and what you are perceiving uh, as far as the feelings around the lack of control and unpredictability that you have in your life. And so this is an aspect that you can control of being able to see what am I perceiving as a stressor or what weight am I putting on this thing that is an actual stress and making it worse. So that's where it also comes in of having the the responsibility of what are you doing that is making your stress worse or adding stress to your life. With those definitions in mind, I wanted to see, especially when it comes to perceived versus actual stress, if you can think of any examples to be able to give. I know I I gave a little bit of an example there, but I think it's really helpful to be able to understand that in someone's own life and being able to relate to that or see where it is in theirs. So I think that this is going to obviously vary, where if the stress that is being put into place is brand new and it's a a new stress in the sense of adversity that's being placed into someone's life, the perceived value of that stress is significantly higher than what it may actually be. And so to give a example, let's say that you are going into a new job and there are tasks that you are educated enough to accomplish, but they're not tasks that you have done before. And so you're perceiving the stress to be significantly higher than what it is because of the unknown in which that task has to take. And then as soon as you get into the process of the task and and start to accomplish it and move forward, that stress continues to go down, not only because you're accomplishing the thing, but you're also realizing that maybe it wasn't as difficult as I was making it up in my head. And so that perceived stress oftentimes is going to stem from fabrication in your own mind of what the situation actually is. I can agree with that, especially because if we're looking at perception, it is your perception of what the task is going to take. 
But like you just said, how many times have you done a task and you say something to the degree of that was easier than I thought or I made that harder than it needed to be? And I think that that's a good lesson to remind yourself of before you go into another task that starts to feel daunting or scary of just putting one foot in front of the other than to be able to look at, hey, how hard really was this task instead of building it up and having that fear or anxiety going into a situation because there's always going to be unpredictability in life. And I think that accepting that is a big part of being able to truly manage stressful situations because you have the understanding that is coursing through every situation that life is unpredictable or life is unfair or I can't control what is what happens in life, but I can control how I react to it. And having that peace, I feel, allows you to have a lot more calmness going into each situation because you have that deep understanding. I think that within approaching the higher perceived stress in general, going back to the step-by-step thought process, is that by allowing for yourself to navigate through the perceived stress with just looking at one component or the the one step that's coming up next and not looking at it as the full project or the full day or, or whatever the situation is because my perceived stress always goes through the roof if I look at my day in its totality and I'm only looking at my complete to-do list where that perceived stress decreases significantly when I am coming from a place of this is the specific task that I'm doing for the next hour, or I'm doing this task for the next two hours. This is the thing that I'm focusing on is much, much easier for me and allows for that overwhelm. Cause I think that overwhelm and perceived stress are one and of the same, if you will, that overwhelm falls off abundantly. Once I'm able to just look at it as a singular component rather than the full thing. You've helped me a lot with this because when I do start to get that anxiety or overwhelm creeping up and you can sense that in me, you normally ask me what's one thing that you can do to get closer to where you need to be instead of letting me freak out about, okay, I have all of these things I have to accomplish. You normally ask me what is one thing that you can do to lessen that. And even if it just lessens it a tiny bit, It is lessening it, and I think that it's really important to understand that something is better than nothing. When it comes to really anything in life, I know that I'm someone, and you are as well, that doesn't like to half-ass things, but it's not looking at it as you're half-assing it. It's within the circumstances, what could I do to make it just a little bit better? And so, yes, we would love to just clear the whole slate of stress, but we can't do that. And we normally can't do that within one day or one task, but we can start chipping away from it. And even within like going on a walk and needing some time for myself, I used to look at it of, okay, I have to spend 15 or 20 minutes going on this walk. But I've started to break that down in my head and say, if I have five minutes, I have five minutes. And that's what I'm going to do with it because it's going to help me feel a little bit better. And next time I'm going to plan to have a little bit more time so I can get 10 minutes in so I feel a little bit better about that. But being able to meet yourself where you're at and where the circumstance is at and taking off a little bite, even if it doesn't clear the whole thing, is a really helpful mentality in my opinion. What I find often is that in higher stress situations, we talk in a lot of generalizations and we find ourselves in a situation where we're just clumping things together and defining things in very general terms in the sense that I'm very stressed, I'm very overwhelmed, I'm stupid, I'm whatever the situation is, and allowing for yourself to really sit back and, and have those defining moments where you're you're sitting down and really seeing why those things are, are being said or why you're thinking those things to give yourself reason and then being able to go from those reasons to actually correcting some of these things and probably realizing that the emotion that you had felt was far more than what was necessary for what was actually going on once you really saw what was behind the curtain. 
And we've been through quite a bit of stress over the past few years. And I know the past year has been a lot. And so what are things or what has been the mentality of yourself to handle more and more and more being put on your plate? Because we all have a certain capacity for stress. And that's going to come into what it looks like for your recoverability and how much stress is stacking up and your ability to recover from it. And this is also why I think it's really important to not just try to avoid stressful situations. Oftentimes when we feel a stress, we feel discomfort with it and we want to avoid it. We want to step around it. But I'm a big fan of going through it, figuring out what's going on and learning how to be in something that's deemed a stressful situation so that you can increase your capacity to handle stress. Because if you always sidestep it, if you always avoid it, you're not going to have capacity to handle stress. And that's something where I have really been proud of both of us for as life has become more and more stressful, we haven't allowed it to absolutely bury us. There's been times, of course, but we have proactively as well as being able to understand ourselves and what we need in a moment handle more and more stress than we would have ever been able to handle in the past. I think that it all is going to come down to you only know what you know. So you can only deal with as much stress as you've been placed under type situation and allowed for yourself to move through. And so as you continue to actually face the stress or face the hurdles that are in front of you, you find ways to be more efficient with them as well as not looking at them with such an emotional lens and being able to look at them from a way that is going to be constructive and allowing for you to handle things to a easier degree. And so as the stress potentially continues to elevate, you're just getting better and better at handling it more so. And I I think that as you are navigating through life, you find yourself in a situation where you're feeling as though that you're pushing for something easier. You're trying to navigate to an easier time of life to give yourself this decompression. And, and I don't think that that easier time is actually what you're striving for. I think that it's you're, you're actually striving for a better understanding of where the stress or where the adversity is coming from so that you can handle it to a better degree rather than it being something where it's not ever going to be there. Because you realize very quickly as you continue to navigate through life that the stress is never just going to be gone. You're going to have periods where it is significantly lower and you're going to have periods where it's significantly higher, but I don't think that it's ever just gone. And, And maybe there's a time when we're in our 70s and 80s and we are just relaxing that there is is no stress and uh, you know more abundantly but i think that through the majority of your life it's going to be that way and so working to not have that as your north star as your goal being to have zero stress but to better handle your stress is a much better pursuit because i i think that you're you're playing a game that has actually no end to it or or you're always going to be feeling defeated or overly stressed because you're seeking something that doesn't actually exist. And so by understanding that it is going to be more important to manage, and this kind of takes you to the analogy of it is much more important to focus on the game than the outcome itself. And so now you're much more focused on how can I handle these things and be able to best perform under these different circumstances to allow for myself to have the best life. And then by having that understanding allows for you to navigate through stress so much better. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Now, with going through these very stressful things before you learned how to manage it, what were some of the symptoms or uh, signs that were coming up in your life and being able to ruminate within either your body or your surroundings because of this stress that had gone unmanaged for a long period of time? 
So going back to the start of COVID, I would say that was the first time that I realized that I had no actual tools for stress management because up until that point, my stress management tactic was resistance training and working out. And that was really the only way that I managed the expression of any stress or anger that I had. And so when that was ripped away from me and in a, in a way, I never thought that that would be taken from me. I thought that would always be something that was accessible to me always. And so that was the first wake up call to me that I had to do a lot of internal work as a, as a whole to find other ways to manage my stress and to manage any, um, frustration, anger, anything of that nature. And so at that point, that was the first time that I had to pivot into my first time going through therapy. So that was my first experience of going into uh, seeing a therapist. And that was very, very helpful for me to speak about my stress because really at that point in my life, I hadn't had a whole lot of, I don't even know if I should say opportunity, but taking the opportunity to speak about my stress and vocalize how I felt and, and all those different factors. So that was huge for me to just have conversation with someone who pushed out of me to actually express myself and how I felt and not just be in a suppressed state of, no, it doesn't matter, just move forward and put on a smile and, and keep keep on keeping on type mentality. So that was the first time of really navigating through that. And then as we um, you know continued on and, and, and stress continued to change, I suppose, I continued to try and find ways that I could better manage my stress as a, as a whole. And the next thing that I had really found was just letting myself relax and not putting myself in this go until the wheels fall off mentality all the time, start to, from the moment I wake up to the end of the day, I'm just going, going, going. That was my mentality. And even if I didn't feel good, or even if I didn't even have the gas to do it, I was forcing myself to do it, even if it was suboptimal type situation or submaximal work. So, so I was able to allow myself to have time and really decompress and take a step back and realize that I just didn't have it at that time. And that was okay. And like giving myself permission through that was a big transition for me as well. And so as I worked into that, that allowed for me to recharge the batteries better and, and be in a better headspace from there. Then some more recent ways that I've been managing my stress has been through other forms of, of fitness and um, that are outside of resistance training. And so getting into yoga has been a really helpful tool for me there. Um, getting into breath work and realizing the having the control over my breath and being able to manage those things has been a tremendous help on that side of things. Coming back to that initial point where talking about how I feel has been a, a big aspect for me. I think that even being vocal in the uh, setting of, I'm just expressing why I, f I feel this particular way. And, and I'll use a recent example for you and I is that yesterday we had a, a conversation over finances and finances has been something from a relationship standpoint that we've struggled with from, from time to time. It's been something that we work through as a team and have gotten drastically better from the time that we started dating, got married, and so on. And we've gotten tremendously better. And it's been kind of put the feet to the fire because we run a business together and we also obviously run a household and all those <laughs> things together. And so we were having a conversation and in times past, I was expressing some of the frustrations that I had around finances at this moment. And in times past, I would have said what I said and just walked away and left it as it was. And yesterday I did a much better job of, I expressed that frustration and said, I, I, I did walk away. I came back within just a few minutes and said, I'm not saying this because I'm frustrated at you. I'm frustrated at the situation. I'm frustrated at you know how things have gone. This has nothing to do of you and I versus one another. This has everything to do with we're a team and I'm just frustrated for us. And that is really, really helpful in that context for me because I'm not now wondering like, did I did I overstep? Did I, did I say something that made her irritated? Nothing of that nature. We talked it all the way through. You understood where I was coming from. And it was a much better conversation for us as a team to be had. And that's a way that 
lowers my anxiety or stress or uh, frustration that I may be ex experiencing. So communication probably is the biggest rock of all of this is being able to really talk through things and vocalize how I feel being the biggest driver. And so that would be the, the handful of rocks. Is there anything else that comes to mind for you? I think within talking about the the conversation that we had yesterday, the biggest thing for growth for you or just your personal stress is that you vocalized of this is what I'm dealing with. And I know that this has been an issue, so to say, for me in the past. And I'm just vocalizing it so that it doesn't build up. And you saying it in that way was really helpful for you and for me. And we've done it with a ton of other topics outside of finances as well of the way that I perceived you doing this or how I know from my past that this has been drawn into it. I have frustrations or stress or whatever the emotion may be. And being able to just own that emotion while still saying that you're working on it and being able to say that this was helpful for me to say because I could have taken it of why did he just come in and dump something on me, but I didn't take it that way even when you had originally like walked away because I knew because past conversations you vocalized of this is something that does stress me out and sometimes just telling someone else or allowing someone to know what's on my mind gives me peace that I don't have to just carry it alone. And that circles back to the beginning of you talking about going to therapy and just being able to talk to someone that you hadn't really had the ability to express where you were at. And that comes deep from your want and desire to be a caretaker. And you wanted to provide for me and for Gus, because Tucker was not even in the picture at that <laughs> point. Uh, you wanted to provide for me and Gus and any future family that we would have. And you have such honor for that caretaker role that you didn't want to complain or burden someone as well as just uh, like everyone has things from their past of, okay, I didn't have a space that I could possibly truly express these things in the past. So I think that it gave you such a relief of you can still be a caretaker, you can still honor that and still provide for our family, but you can also still show softness. And I didn't want to use the word weakness there because I don't, I don't view it as a weakness to truly be able to have vulnerability. And I know that when people have asked us relationship advice, and I try not to give excess relationship advice because each person is in their own relationship and you should really take that forward, is being able to truly be vulnerable with someone you say you love. Because that vulnerability, and we talked about it and a few other podcasts of just being able to ask for what you need goes such a long way because someone can't read your mind. And so that vulnerability comes into play there of sometimes you have to stand naked metaphorically in front of the person that you love. You know, sometimes you're actually standing <laughs> naked in front of the person it's you a love. crazy concept. But metaphorically also standing so unclothed and saying like, this is what I'm dealing with or this is what's going on in my head because that's something I love so deeply about our relationship, about our marriage, is that we can just be ourselves and tell the other person what's going on without this fear of it's going to be either weaponized against me or I have to carry this alone and I just have to figure it out. And that's where practices like journaling or meditation or talk therapy can be so helpful, regardless of if you're in a relationship or not, because it gives you that vehicle to be vulnerable and to be able to get to the root of the issue because oftentimes with stress, like I said, you want to avoid it. And so you don't want to look into it deeper. You don't want to figure out what's going on. You just want to get out of this stress. I want this bear to stop chasing me. But really being able to stop and look and say, what does this actually mean is going to allow you to not only handle more stress, but have the recognition of what is stress in your life, even if it looks different from someone else, and then being able to take the next steps to fix something, so to speak, if that's what needs to be done in that realm. 
And I know within strength training, we often have to tell clients when they say that's the thing that's stress relieving for me of, yes, it is stress relieving and it can be something that you have in your life overall for stress and to be able to manage that, but it's also a stress on your body. But the question I had for you was, do you think that your years of strength training have actually made you be able to handle more stress because of the adaptations to stress that your body has been? under. Before I answer your question, I think that adding to what you had said about within our relationship and how we navigate and are able to be more vulnerable with one another, that has come with relentless practice and (laughs) and ability to want to be that way. It's not just something that we came into our relationship and immediately had. We <laughs> we didn't have any of it at the beginning. And that was something that we had to pull out of one another and desire for ourselves to be able to get to that point. And so if you are in a relationship with someone else or you are just focusing on the relationship you have with yourself, that vulnerability is something that you have to chip away at and consistently chip away at. It's something that if if you are focusing on it and and making a direct effort to improve it, it's going to continue to improve. Maybe some days it's 0.01% and some days it's 1%. But if you neglect it and don't spend time on it, even if it's just you being vulnerable with yourself, because you can create some lies intrinsically for yourself (laughs) to believe of what the environment really is for you or what your way you are or whatever it is, it's going to go the opposite direction. The vulnerability is going to get less and less and you're going to hide more and more from yourself in those scenarios. And so it's something that just needs a daily effort and a commitment from both parties to want to be better on that side of things. Now, answering your question on the training, I think that this is something that I view as my ability to handle stress is definitely enhanced it because of the stress through physical activity, through sports and through um, communication through those sports and working as a team and all those different factors, that plays a large role. And then my ability to just continue to show up in the gym and show up and uh, challenge myself, increase the weight and and get sore, come back, train that tissue again and, and repetitively do that over and over for over a decade now it allows for me to have a better understanding that um, the repetitions are are so important, but also being able to handle stress is going to get better and better as I have more consistency. And so with those pillars being learned from the gym, that being applied to my day-to-day life, I would assume allows for me to have a better understanding to the stress that comes from a day-to-day perspective allows for me to handle that stress greater. Because I think that if I didn't have that as an outlet on a regular basis, some of that stress that would come into my life, I would probably get much more irritable or, or fly off the handle because I just haven't had that same release to the resistance training as I do. I haven't done something hard for myself to strengthen my mind or what have you. And so by not having those tools that that strengthen that ability, I'm in a place of greater weakness, if you will. Thus, my ability to handle stress is lower. And so by just having that kind of simple, logical correlation, I think that it does play a really beneficial role. Because I, I will say that within the sports and, and resistance training, I'm not so sure that I would have had the resilience to start physique development and to be able to go through the the days of where it just, things aren't working, you know, it's, it's things. <laughs> There's days that things don't feel like they're working. It's not just linear. The, the days where you're putting in so much effort and there, there's not a whole lot of, of, um, reaction, if you will, to what's being put into place. And uh, you're not getting clients, you're not uh, growing on social media, whatever the situation may be, being able to be resilient and and trusting in the fact of just penny deposits on a day-to-day basis. A lot of that was the root of of my understanding and and, uh, ability to have that came from sports. It came from resistance training. And so I think that it plays a, a huge role. On that same vein, you had made a post talking about 
uh, sets to failure. And I think that this goes in within you saying earlier of you have to put yourself under stress to be able to become more efficient to even be able to handle more stress. And within your post, you were talking about when people self-selected their loads for reaching failure, it ended up being about like 50% of what their actual one rep max was going to be. And being in that sports arena, being in that weight training arena, you have had to push yourself to failure. And you also understand you push yourself to failure and you're still okay. You can still come back and grow from it, learn from it, achieve something from it. It's not that you just, quote, failed. And so I think that plays a role in exactly what you were saying about the benefits of resistance training, of it allowed you to push yourself to that absolute limit to gain that resilience. And it wasn't just the self-selected load. You had to be in that place where, hey, this is the the weight on the bar and I'm going to have to go under it. I'll add that more often than not, when I'm looking at clients' submissions of training, they are not failing on an exercise because of muscular failure. More often than not, they're failing in their head before they even go into the set, which is going to have a direct correlation to life as a whole, where more often than not, the reason that someone falls short of the goal that they had was that they were probably in their own way. Like they may not have had the best resources or may not have had the uh, best circumstances as a whole, but when it really gets down to it, they just did not believe in themselves enough to continue to push through the most ad- adver- like uh, highest adversity moments as a whole. And so <clears throat> that's the other thing is that oftentimes people are training and have already defeated themselves in their mind before they even go into the set of, well, I- I've tried to get this weight before and I'm just, I- I've never gotten it. There's just no way I'm getting it this time, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm going to, I'm going to put them up and see what happens. And I was actually having a conversation with a client today on her training. And she had talked about how she'd been at this specific weight for dumbbell overhead press for forever. And she's tried forties or whatever the weight was many, many times and just never can get it up. She can do 35s for six or seven repetitions, but as soon as she picks up the 40, she can't do one. And it's like, okay, there is going to be a discrepancy in overall strength when you go up and wait. You're probably not going to get six or seven like you were with 35s, but you're going to be able to pump out a handful if, if we're really looking at the total strength of this. And so when she had vocalized that she couldn't even get one, I really honed in on the mental aspect of this, of this is all in your head. Like you are capable of doing this. It's just a matter of believing in yourself to do this. And if it is, if it is just a matter of having a spotter or we can correlate this to life of having a a partner who's willing to nudge you along and really encourage you to believe in yourself, then that's going to be a way that you can see and get out of your own way to accomplish the things that you have in front of you or or navigate through the stress that you have at at the immediate moment. And I would say, right when you said that, I thought you were going to tell a story about me and the squat bar, (laughs) but- Well, it is you still do. That is still me to this day, and I know it, and I'm working on it. When it comes to specifically squats, I have a really big mental block, and I count myself out mentally far before I hit failure. And even the other day, I did not want to train legs. I did not want to train, period. And Alex and I decided to train legs together, and he had written out the session, and we go in there and I'm thinking, okay, we're both uh, in a place where we just need to have this session. It's going to be a good session, but we're going to knock out a few exercises and move on. And I thought the big exercise was going to be the leg press. And I was already mentally prepared for it. And then he starts getting out the squat bar and loading on weight. And I mentally, all of a sudden, I'm just done. I'm I complained. I was like, I can't do that right now. Why are we choosing the squat bar? I thought we were going to do the leg press. And he just said, we're doing squats today. And I ended up doing a lot more weight than I definitely thought I could do, especially on that day. Did I hit a PR on that day? No. But for what that day had, I 
achieved way more than what I originally thought I could just by putting it out of my mind that I couldn't do it and not letting that perpetuate and become overwhelm or become anxiety because I had already made a decision. And there's a point in life where you have to take inventory and you have to take ownership of how much you are playing a role in your own suffering. And this comes into play mostly with life and not just training, but so many people put them in, put themselves in a place that their life stinks and that they are the reason for the suffering they're going through, but they might not have the tools or the want to develop the tools to get to a spot where their life can be better. And when we are looking at stress and looking at, well, there are things that you can change and fix, and there's things that you can't change. I really like to dive into what those things that you can and can't change are. And going back to the example within clients of making them get specific about what they're stressed about, I'll often ask clients to make a list of five to 10 things that are stressing them out right now, and what is something, if anything, that they can do about it. And they might answer something to the degree of there is all this long laundry that needs to be done. And then the thing that they can do is set aside time to do some laundry. But then it might be of my work is really not putting me in a positive spot. And you can't always necessarily just automatically change your work. Yes, I could give you the advice of go and quit your job, but you you can't always do that. And so because you can't maybe change that metric, you have to look further into what can I do about it? If I can't change the job, can I change how I contribute to the environment? Can I change what my boundaries are to give myself a better environment? Can I change my mentality as I'm going into this to make sure that I'm not letting this soak into who I am or what my the rest of my life is and cause me to just be negative and complain about it? Because we're big believers that complaining itself is putting you in a stressful situation of chronic complaining, not just complaining to a friend or a spouse about something that happened, but being someone who always has something to complain about. If you're not doing shit about it, I really do not feel bad for you at all because there is definitely a line of complain, 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 complain. If you've still done absolutely nothing about it, then you don't have a right to complain anymore because you are consistently putting yourself in that situation and not doing anything about it. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. So with that no complaining rule, do you feel like you have other ways that you challenge clients to handle stress better? I do. And I feel like the core of it comes down to taking care of yourself. And I know when we hear terms like self-care or stress-relieving practices, we might just go to, okay, I need a journal and I need to meditate and I need to take a bath and have a 20-hour nighttime routine. But I really don't look at self-care like that. I truly ask myself, what can I do to care for myself? And that might be of a situation within travel, if I'm feeling stressed about going and traveling, what's one thing I know I can do and I can control that's going to allow me to lower my stress? I'm going to make a plan and see what needs to be done so that I can take action and have something to focus on. Because again, when you're having that stress, it's starting to pull you away from how you normally feel and what your values are and how you want to show up as a person. And it can make you irritable. It can make you short-tempered. And like I said, it can affect your mental health quite a bit. And so being able to, at the core of it, take care of yourself, you're always going to be less stressed if you are taking care of yourself. And I already mentioned sleep, but truly prioritizing sleep can make a world of difference in anything regarding stress. But even being able to look at what is one thing I can do to care for myself today. And yesterday, I had way too much going on. And I had another meeting. And after my fourth or fifth meeting of the day, I was done, but I had one more meeting to do. And I asked myself, 
do I do this meeting and just power through because I made this commitment and I need to do it? Or depending on, again, the situation, I was able to reach out to the person and say, hey, I I completely overbooked myself. This is my thing that I made a mistake on, but would you be able to move this meeting to Thursday so that I can get everything done and be able to show up the way I want to for this meeting? Because it was a meeting I was excited about and wanted to be on, but where my mentality was, I wasn't going to be able to really show up for that person. And not every time a meeting or an event can be changed like that, but that is an example of instead of just pushing through to check it off my list, I looked at what do I need to do today? And Alex and I had gone on a walk and he had asked me, what can you do to really get things done? And I knew that changing that meeting time was going to put me in such a better spot for me to wrap up what I needed to do and set myself up for the next day. And always being able to get in tune with yourself to even notice when you are starting to get stressed or when a situation might cause you stress. I feel like at this point, I'm very self-aware of what each situation in my life might bring into my life. And with uh, going to the baseball game, I could have sat there and been, well, what am I going to eat? And I'm stressed about going and how long are we going to be gone? But instead, I, I looked at the weather. I made sure I was dressed appropriately. I have a Mexican restaurant that I had been wanting to try and I recognized it was just two minutes from the ballpark. So I was like, perfect, let's go out to eat before or after, uh, got some peanuts at the ballpark and got my water so that I could feel my best. And those were all things I did to take care of myself. And that just took a little bit of pre-planning, a little bit of self-reflection and years of learning myself. Like that, that didn't happen quickly, but it happened over time of making these small decisions to take care of myself so I could show up my best. Even like the example of the walk earlier of being able to recognize, hey, something is better than nothing. I can't go on this 20-minute walk, but I can take five minutes for myself, and I know I need to step away from my computer. I know I need some fresh air, so I'm going to take that for myself instead of saying, oh, you have so much more work to do. You have so much more you have to get done at your desk. It was, I can't do this without doing this for myself. And so at the core of really all of my advice when it comes to stress is being able to recognize what you personally need, and that first is going to take a lot of introspection and a lot of trial and error, like you mentioned, of we didn't just figure it out on the first go. It took us trialing something, trying to have a conversation, learning how to understand the other person to the spot that we are now. And like you mentioned, of people just want to get to the place where it's easy. It's having that understanding that it's not really ever going to be easy. And you get to choose which hard that you have in your life. And that gives me so much peace and understanding of what stress is, because I can always reflect back to that. I think that the point in which you bring up of just focusing on yourself speaks to one of our, our core tenants within extreme ownership. And I think that within extreme ownership, something to, to speak on and something that I believe wholeheartedly is that power follows the, the blame finger. And what I mean by that is that as you are navigating through things, and if you're not focusing on yourself, you find yourself in a situation where you are blaming others or blaming other things for what's going on. And oftentimes that is going to give that thing or that person power over you because you're allowing for that to be the case and you're not taking ownership of what the situation is at hand. And so by allowing for yourself to really hone in and see what you can do to better perform throughout your day or better handle your day as a whole, and not allowing for that blame finger to go anywhere but yourself, I think is somewhere, something that you have to be very cognizant of and allows for you to have much more peace of mind rather than having that finger pointing somewhere else. And you find yourself in a situation where this stress is now perceived to be significantly higher or 
even worse is that that stress is not something that you can change because now it's placed onto someone else that is just going to continue to perpetuate where um, if you weren't pointing that blame finger and looking internally, you'd actually have some actual things that you could probably change that would make your environment or situation better. And so by having that you know question or, or having that extreme ownership is something that you have to adapt to and, and to withhold because it just is is a place where you're going to feel so much better and feel so much more in control. And what I find with clients is that they'll often be in a place where they're very stressed and that's when they s- try to start something to help with their stress relief of, oh, I've never meditated before in my life, but I'm going to try and meditate right now because I have very high stress. And I always like to look at the fact of you should have a stress management routine, so to speak, or at least a stress management arsenal of, okay, I know at least I have one thing that I can do to be able to show up for myself or to temporarily remove stress. And being able to have that arsenal and start to build that up so you have a lot of things in your arsenal just makes handling stress so much easier. And like I said at the beginning of we have a lot of times where people ask us, how do you handle all of that going on? And it's really because I have a literal arsenal of so many different things I can turn to when my stress is unmanaged or starting to get higher or I recognize it starting to take over those values that I have and take over my personality, I can always go back to those things. And so being able to build it up, even when it doesn't feel like it is helping at first, is going to create an environment and a situation that you're not having to be so high stress and you're like, I need to figure something out right now. And I think the final thing that we can end on today is speaking on grace, because I think that grace is the only way that you're going to be able to get to a place where you're better handling your stress. Because as we've talked about, a lot of this comes down to repetition. And so by having those repetitions, there are going to be reps in there that are 20% better. And you're probably going to have some reps in there that are 20% worse. And you handle yourself very poorly in those different cases. And you have to be okay with that being the outcome But by being okay does not mean that you are going to tolerate that again. You are recognizing that that was the case and you're wanting and working to be better the next time that this comes into play. And so by giving yourself grace, this was the probably, and it's funny because we're getting to this at the very end of this conversation, but I'm now, as I'm talking through it, realizing that this was probably even bigger than the communication tidbit for me is that by allowing myself to have that grace, something that I I don't think that I embodied until my mid to late 20s at this point. I don't think I ever gave myself true grace in moments and, and berated myself more often than not when I made mistakes. And that was so wrong on so many different levels. But now being in a place where I have given myself grace, that's the only way that you unlock the ability to manage these things moving forward and allowing for yourself to be more focused on the game itself and the progression that you're making in these different arenas, not striving for just perfection, but striving for better than you were the day prior. And I know it's so cliche and it's so easy to hear in one ear and out the other and be like, yeah, 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 you've got it figured out. I'll figure out my own way. Like this is the way that I'm going to figure it out. And trust me, I've I felt the exact same way. I tried everything but that. Exactly. I I thought that I could figure out everything on my own and do it on my own tune and, and not follow any of the very abundant and real ways to go about these things that is so clear through history as well as individuals who are successful and who have done a great job of managing these different things. I thought, I'm, I'm different. I can do this totally different. I can do it my way. And the reality is, is that's just not the case. And as soon as I allowed for myself to have grace, it was the time that I really transformed myself and my mentality and, and the way that I handle things. There was definitely a point where when I tried to 
tell you to give yourself grace, which if you know anything about Alex, you can't just tell him to do something. Uh, but when I would try to be like, hey, you should, this happened and this happened, you should give yourself grace, you're going to move forward and do better, you would often respond that those were just excuses. So do you feel like there was a specific shift or was it just after you had tried absolutely everything that you started to recognize that there is quite a difference between excuses and grace? Yes, I think that there came a point where I realized that not everything has to be an excuse, but it was it was also environment for me where really any time that I maybe previously tried to give myself grace, that was echoed that it that was not grace, that was an excuse. And so by changing that environment, that was a big help by having you be my, you know, partner and and working through things with me. So that was a a big help. So I don't know if there's any turning point necessarily, maybe me just listening better to you. That's a weird concept. <laughs> yeah, so many things I could have taught you sooner. <laughs> yeah. And uh, from there, probably the first time that I gave myself grace and it was something where it gave me peace of mind and I was still able to make progress, I think that that was very valuable as well. And this will probably resonate with a lot of competitors within bodybuilding because all this the same thing applied to me dieting following my time with bodybuilding. And so my only experience with dieting was with body. I had never dieted prior to my time in which I was getting ready for a competition. I had always been trying to put on as much weight as possible. I had always had the luxury of eating as much as I could to try and put on weight and, and couldn't because of my activity level, because of my metabolism, what have you. And so following my time with bodybuilding, that was my only understanding of dieting. And so I expected that out of myself every time I tried to get into a dieting phase. And I would find myself in a situation where that 100% perfection that you have to have for prep and trying to make that part of your lifestyle is not feasible. It's just not something that you can do. There's there's days I could do it for three, four, five days. I could do it for maybe two weeks in a row, but something's going to come up where it's life, bro. And you have to make a shift in those different factors. And I would get so torn up about that and, and been out of shape. And once I allowed for myself to have grace through the dieting and, and um, allowed for myself to have greater flexibility, that was the moment in which things changed for me that I could see, oh my gosh, I can have this like 80 to 90% adherence and having this 10 to 20% of flexibility that's necessary because of life and just allowing for me to live and still see the fat loss that I desire. Will it be at the same pace at, at which I would have seen through a bodybuilding competition? No, but I, I also, that's not what I'm striving for. I'm not striving for that abundance of, of overall fat loss when I go into a lifestyle deficit. And so by giving myself grace in that setting, that unlocked a lot in my head and it allowed for me to have so much more peace of mind. And so that may be a good example of situationally, that experience allowed for me to have much greater grace within my nutrition, within my training, um, within my cardio allocate, all the things from a fitness perspective allowed for me to see it through a different lens and was, was very transformative for me on that front. Yeah, I believe that so much of that has to do with just being able to truly understand the circumstance and the effort and expectation of all of those things. Because I think a lot of times people do use circumstance as an excuse, 100%. But there is also a time where the circumstance requires grace or the circumstance is putting you in a place that you have to give yourself grace. And it's being able to call yourself out on your own bullshit because you know what is an excuse for yourself and what isn't. You truly do know at the core of when you're making an excuse for yourself. And being able to, again, like really turn inward and understand, was I making an excuse or was this what happened and now I need to move past it? And we talk about this a lot in the Perfectionism podcast. And if you haven't given that one a listen, I would definitely go and check that one out. But we talk about the fact of being able to 
keep moving forward when things aren't perfect or things don't go the way that you want. And as I've mentioned a few times, life isn't perfect. Life isn't something that you can 100% control. You're never going to be 100% stress-free. And being able to accept that and then just keep taking the next step forward is going to provide so many more results than trying to be perfect because you really can't be perfect. And that shouldn't be discouraging encouraging to you of, I can't be perfect, so why even freaking try? Or I can't do this right, why even try? It's being able to see, I didn't do this specific thing, but I can keep trying and keep moving the needle forward and keep working towards whatever goal that I might have in that moment. That'll be all for us today, talking all about stress. But if you're watching this on YouTube, I'd love to hear any of your stress management techniques and being able to help out anyone else who's reading through the comments. But otherwise, make sure you share this with a friend, you subscribe and like as well. And we'll catch you in the next one.